Good afternoon, SITREP operators. It is your host once more. It's me. It's me. Ariskany Jim here on a SITREP Sunday and here to talk about some questions and some, I don't want to say issues, but some questions and some curiosities that have been brought up by some people in our community to talk about how it is we actually put on these games that we do every well it used to be every sunday now we might be talking about every other sunday who knows we'll see how it goes um but some people have been asking about how we actually do this um there are a lot of virtual uh what's the word here uh, virtual options out there that you can use there's roll d20 there's a, like virtual rpg I, i'm not even really familiar tabletop rpg i'm not even really familiar with them because frankly i don't use them um i think some people are looking for like a magic answer Oh, there's this secret app out there that Oriskany has to create these either Pan's Leader, Valor and Victory, Arab Israeli Wars, Sit Rep Skirmish, Contact Front, um, Naval Command, Air War C21, all these virtual games that he runs, um, you know, every week with people all around the globe, up to and including uh, even some science fiction options. And it's always like, well, how does he do that? There must be some kind of a um, uh, of an app or a tool or a website he goes to. No. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm afraid I've got some bad news. It's just Microsoft Excel. Um, it's uh, Skype to share the screen with different people. And uh, a buttload of hard work. It's just friggin' work. I'm sorry. It's a four-letter word in today's language. But it's really just work. So um, we're going to go over how we do that in virtual sense. And um, also we're going to go over how it is we actually expand some of these games into new eras or new settings so there's a lot of great games out there sometimes they're a little old sometimes they're not valor and victory is brand new battle group is you know brand new running around still has releases coming out uh, you know at, at the moment at the same time um, they don't cover all the areas that we like to cover there's a lot of modern war games out there uh, a lot of skirmish modern war games. I mean, if you're into skirmish games, that's great. But if you're into skirmish battle, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, modern battle games, there's not a lot of options. There are some good ones out there. I mean, Battle, um, battle uh, sorry, North Ag by uh, the same people who make Battle Group. That's how I got confused there, uh, is a great example. Um, and there's a few others. GHQ Micro Armor, but again, that game's old. We can't talk about old games because old games aren't friggin' awesome compared to the garbage that gets published nowadays um not universally but <laughs> largely uh the trash that gets that gets put out there nowadays that's why we use a lot of older games the the problem with that and this goes into the questions that we've gotten across a couple of our uh platforms most notably by a guy named Noman Niesco from Facebook so um if you hear this podcast or I'm sorry if you hear this live stream um uh, Noman, that's the name I was given. Uh, this is the stream where we really try to answer some of your questions. There's been about between five and ten people that have asked us variations of this same kind of two basic questions. Number one, how do you put these games on uh, virtually? And number two, when you take a World War II game like Panzer Leader or Valorant Victory or Battle Group, how do you expand it into the modern era? We know what a Panzerkampfwagen Mark II is. We know what a Panzerkampfwagen VI Tiger is. We know what a Sherman is in these other systems. We know what their, their stat lines are. We know what their values are. How is it that you can convert this system to handle Challenger twos, T-55s, Abrams, Leopard twos, things like that? Um, I think sometimes people are getting the idea that I'm guessing. Once again, I've got some bad news. Uh, we're not guessing. We we have some some information that we go by uh, in order to uh, at least make pretty good estimates um, as far as what these values actually would be. So we're going to go over that in today's stream, which is honestly a little short. Um, oh wow, we got some people coming in on the chat. Number one, before we even got started, we had uh, because science teacher. Thanks very much for coming by. Piotr from Poland. Thanks very much for coming by. Uh, Dennis Cross, I believe from Kansas still. Uh, thanks very much for coming by. And now we have Rattlesnake88 checking in all the way from Sweden. Awesome. So we are in like a whole bunch of countries already. 
Cool, so let's go ahead and get started. Again, today, guys, we don't have a game. It's going to be a relatively short stream. Today's content might be a little dry. We're literally going to be looking at Excel spreadsheets most of the stream. Um, and I mean that, like, literally. <laughs> like, here's how you do this formula. Here's how you, you know, concatenate these values. Here's how you, you know, round if and sum these. You know, it's going to get a little dry. But... Number one, we're going to keep it short because we know it's going to be like chewing on, you know, a mouthful of drywall. And number two, um, these are questions that the community have been asking. And uh, it's, I can't answer the same question like 52 times. I'm just going to make one big uh, video, or not big video, one video that kind of addresses as much of this as I can. And when these uh, comments and questions come in, from now on, I'm just going to refer them to this video, and we're going to go ahead and do as much as we can here. Hello, Damon from the UK. Man, we're like the United Nations in here today. This is awesome. Okay, um, and that leads us to one last question that sometimes people aren't asking, but they're kind of asking in an oblique way. Um, how do I get my hands on some of these materials? Uh, if you want to try them out yourself. Well, if you scroll down in the YouTube discord i'm sorry in the youtube description of this video you will find a link to our discord join our discord reach out to me i'm right there my name is ariskany underscore jim you're gonna find me i'm like one of the administrators of our discord come into our discord the uh invite is right there in the description of this video on youtube check it out and um you know join our community and reach out and let us know um you know what it is you're looking for and uh, I'll see if I can make it happen. Discord number one has a great file sharing system. If you reach out to me, as many people have, and there's nothing wrong with that, but if you reach out to me, as many people have in the Facebook comments, and says, where can I get the counter sheets for your 1991 Gulf War Marines, um, you know, Panzer Leader system, how am I actually supposed to send that to you? I don't have your email address. I can't post it in YouTube. Um, Discord has a great file sharing uh, capability. I can send you that file, no problem, either privately or publicly. Um, and also, you know, if you want something from us, you guys, you guys, you guys got to join our community. <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, if you're watching this this channel, you're already either a part of our Twitch or our, our uh, YouTube community. You thank you, thank you a hundred times. But if you're watching this later. Uh, you know, it's like some random person who finds us on YouTube. Number one, you know, please subscribe. And even if you don't want to subscribe, that's fine. You know, we're not trying to make like bags of money on this. We shut down our Patreon. We don't ask for donations. We're not looking for money. But if you want to get like some materials from us, we I personally have no problem with that. But, uh, you know, join our community. You have to join us on Discord. Um, that way we at least, you know, you have we have one more user on Discord. That makes our Discord a little bit better. And also, Discord is a great place I can send it to you privately. I don't have to ask you for your email address and, you know, all that stuff. Alrighty, so here we go with, um, let's go ahead and get this started. Okay, we're going to keep this one kind of short. So the first thing that people are asking is how you come up with your values uh, for um, Expanded Panzer Leader. Okay, so number one, Panzer Leader is a great game. Um, Panzer Leader, which is also Panzer Blitz, Panzer Leader, and most importantly for this particular conversation, Arab-Israeli Wars. Um, it's like one first, second, and third edition of, of that same basic system. They did make huge changes in there, but those are the three basic additions uh, to that system. Arab-Israeli Wars will bring you up to 1973, Yom Kippur War, so you're halfway home already um if you have uh, the basic panzer leader set and you have you know the arab is really war set which you can either find on google or if you just wanted a, a uh, it, it's been out of print since like 1977 um if you want a uh, a virtual copy of at least some of the counters i'm sure they're available on places like board game geek um there there are people that have it uh no problem a lot of the maps are available on places like imaginativestrategist.com, all one word. Again, that's Imaginative Strategist. That's an amazing website where uh, a friend of mine, um, I, I hesitate to call him a friend, not because I don't like him, but because he is like a, a demigod in the Panzer Leader community. I'm talking about Alan Arvold. 
Um, I've been working with him with some of our Gross Deutschland uh, uh, expansion stuff lately. He really is a, a pioneer in keeping Panzer Leader system going. Uh, long past this property has long since kind of, you know, uh, been out of print. And, uh, yeah. So, okay, real quick, here's how we get going here. All right, so a Panzer Leader counter. Let me go ahead and slap a Panzer Leader counter in here real fast. All right, so for those of you who aren't, aren't familiar, Panzer Leader runs on four basic values. Um, the, atta uh, the attack factor is this one here at upper left. The range is here at upper right. The defense factor is at lower left. And the movement is at lower uh, is at lower right. How many hexes the, the vehicle, I'm sorry, how hard the vehicle hits is this number here. How far in hexes can it shoot? how well it resists incoming attack, and uh, how far it can move per turn in hexes. Okay, so, cool. Um, we're gonna go over very quickly how we go over those four basic values. Okay, so here we have, okay, so number one, we're gonna start with attack factor, AF, is how it's written in Panzer Leader, and RF, range factor, uh, again, how it's written in Panzer Leader. How we come up with those two values. Okay, so the values that come in the game are the ones I've been kind of aiming at. So we see here a Panzer um or Panzer if you want to be the, the short way, whatever, uh, a Mark II um, early war battle tank. Okay, it carries the L55 two centimeter automatic cannon. All right, no problem. Um, it comes off with, I start off with, I start off with a base number and that's based simply on the size of the gun. So you see a two centimeter starts off with a two, a 3.7 starts off with a five. I go up to a six for 40 millimeter, a seven for five centimeters, an eight for 57 millimeter, and you know, it goes up from there. All the way up to stuff that people are shooting at each other nowadays. Okay, so these numbers get a little crazy. <laughs> but the idea is to make sure that the whole game is reverse compatible. So if you were really demented and you wanted to put one platoon of Mark, I'm sorry, one platoon of, say, M1A1 Abrams in the middle of uh, a division of, uh, you know, 1939 Panzer III's with 37 millimeter guns, you could technically do it and come up with a realistic result. I don't know how that game would turn out, but <laughs> Panzer Leader would at least, with, with these formulas and with this math, Panzer Leader would theoretically support it. Oh, cool. Thanks very much for putting in that link, um, because Science Teacher, I appreciate it. So the Imaginative Strategist figure, I'm sorry, the, Iman the Imaginative Strategist website is in our Twitch stream. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just, to be cool, also uh, put it in our... All right, the Imaginative Strategist uh, link is also now in our YouTube chat. So give it a, give it a look. Um, you're going to see a lot of these miniatures here, uh, not miniatures, a lot of these counters uh, in that website. Again, by a guy named Alan Arville, the guy who's been doing this for decades. He won't have anything in there for um, for moderns. So the moderns is the stuff that I do. But he takes the basic stuff that came out in Panzer Blitz East Front, Panzer Leader West Front, and he expands it all over the place. You can do Chindits versus Japanese Special Naval Landing Force uh, with, his, with his counters. You can do, you know, for literally anything in World War II. So that's one way you can expand it. You can just look at people who have already done this. Um, okay, so I'm not going to go through every single cell here because we would be here till Christmas, literally. So um, this is just basically how it works. What this formula row here does is it takes the base number that you have based on the caliber of the gun. I shouldn't say the caliber gun, like this, the, the, the bore of the gun. Um, again, two centimeter, 37 millimeter, 40 millimeter. These are the common World War II sizes for, excuse me, these are the common sizes you see for World War II tank guns. And it just starts off with a base number. After that, we have a, four columns of modifiers. And hopefully you can see the, ooh, I turned off the formula bar. Hold on, let me uh, open up the formula bar so you can see what's going on here. All right, so all this formula does, as you can see, it's very simple by Excel standards. Um, all it does is it takes that base number 
and it multiplies it by a series of modifiers um, and gives you a final result. So two centimeter is the basic gun that was like with one of the earliest tanks in World War II. You, the caliber is the same, training, basically how good the army is. Uh, if you want to give your, your counter, like, oh, this is IDF, or this is elite Waffen SS Panzer troops, or who knows what, a Grenadier Guards. If you want to make it like an elite unit, you could give it like a 1.2, and it might change the value a little bit, um, or not, because again, it rounds everything off. So again, it's the base number, multiplied by, multiplied by, multiplied by, multiplied by, there's obviously no electronics, you know, no ballistic firing computers in World War II. Um, so that's always going to be a one, at least until we get into the 1960s or 70s. So basically we have two multiplied by one, four times. Surprise, surprise, you wind up with a two. Okay, so that's a simple one. Okay. Um, and then you just keep going from that. And what you're going to wind up with here is... You know, what I was aiming at here was to was to ha produce a table that would give you the results that we see in actual published Panzer Blitz or Panzer Leader. Um, the one exception being the Russians, but I'll get to that when we get to that. So here we have, say, uh, the 37 millimeter, the American L56 gun. Um, that actually is a mistake here. Ooh, ooh, hold on. All right, I'll have to fix that later. But this 37 millimeter gun, um, the L56, that's a nice long barrel. Okay, so for people who may not know about how guns work, uh, James Cuts is on Twitch. Oh, cool! Thanks very much, James Cuts. Thanks for coming by. Um, I tried to put it into YouTube, but it wouldn't let me. Don't worry about it because Science Teacher, I went ahead and I did it. So that link is already in um, is already in YouTube. I took care of that for us. No worries. So okay. For those, of, for those, pe for people in the community who might not know, um, I'm gonna do this super fast because it's, it's it gets kind of crazy. Um, how well a tank gun puts a hole in another tank has a lot less to do with the size of the shell that it's firing. What it really has to do with, or what really matters, is the speed at which the shell hits or the speed at which the projectile hits the enemy armor plate, okay? Um, to put it in beginning 101 physics terms, EK equals one half mass times velocity squared, okay? Here's a very simple thought experiment that you can kind of walk your way through with it. It's very, very approximate, it's very rhetorical, it doesn't make any real mathematical sense. But picture yourself being struck by an object that weighs 100 pounds times miles per hour. I know that doesn't really make any sense, but okay, say, picture yourself being struck by an object that weighs 100 pounds, moving at one mile an hour. That's basically a small girlfriend or a large child, like, bumping into you in the hallway. You know, no big deal. You're not even going to feel it, probably. Okay, now have a 10 pound object hit you at 10 miles an hour you can already see where i'm going with this that might leave a bruise that somebody taking something off of a off of a shelf and tossing it to you and you didn't realize it was coming and it hit you in the shoulder it might leave you with a bruise let's continue the experiment let's have something hit you that weighs one pound traveling at 100 miles an hour it's still 100 when you multiply 100 times 1 or 10 times 10 or 1 times 100 you still wind up with 100 so if it was straight multiplication if mass and velocity had equal import you would you'd be taking the same amount of damage but a one pound object traveling at 100 miles an hour is basically a major league fastball pitch that's breaking a bone or giving you a concussion if you're lucky um one more step how about something that weighs one tenth of a pound moving at you at a thousand miles an hour that's a high-speed rifle bolt, and that is killing you outright or ripping something off. If it hits you in a limb, you, you've just lost that limb. Now, I realize the math in that little example was absurdly simplified, but just as a rhetorical example, speed kills. What determines how fast a tank shell flies through the air is very, very often, especially in World War II and previous, simply the length of the gun barrel. 
Okay, so if you have a, f okay, here's a good example. Here, I'll get all these 75, um, these uh, 7.5 centimeter examples. Okay, you can have the 75 millimeter howitzer that the Germans had in the early Mark IVs. Um, do I have any of those here? Actually, yes, I do. The Mark IV D. It only has a five attack factor and it's H class, which means it divides in half against armored targets. It's really only got a two and a half. Uh, at the same time, you're going to have a 75 millimeter fired from a Panther that hits you at 16. Same size gun, 75 millimeter, but you just went from a two and a half to a 16. That's an extremely uh, pronounced uh, delta in kinetic impact and thus armor penetration value. What's the difference? The length of the barrel. Um, so why does length of the barrel matter? Very simply, um, a, the, the propellant in a tank shell does not explode. It burns very, 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 very to the very power. Uh, it burns very, very quickly. So it's constantly expanding. It doesn't technically by the laws of physics actually explode it just burns extremely fast and as it burns it continues to expand and as long as the tank shell or the tank projectile is inside the barrel um, it's being propelled by the expanding gases behind it the nanosecond it leaves the muzzle of the gun it's no longer being um, accelerated by those compressed and expanding explosive gases behind it so it's no longer expanding. In fact, because of gravity and air resistance and all the other forces that act on a flying tank shell, it's immediately decelerating from that point forward. So if your gun barrel is four feet long and my gun barrel is eight feet long, your shell is being accelerated for maybe one nanosecond. My shell is being accelerated by two nanoseconds or milliseconds or however long it is. Um, that might not sound like a lot, but my shell is literally being propelled for twice as long as yours is. It's leaving the barrel with twice the velocity. That means it's going to travel twice as far and it's going to hit your tank twice as hard. And because it's traveling twice as far and you're going to hit your tank twice as fast, it's going to have four times the impact as far as anti-tank armor penetration value. The inevitable question is, why don't they just put huge friggin' tank barrels? Because it's just a length of pipe, right? That's what Oddball says, because Oddball is totally an expert. Why don't we just put a big length of pipe on the end of our gun? Well, number one, the first time Oddball fired that tank and that piece of pipe goes flying off of his gun, number one. And number two, um, ask the guys who tried to put the 17-pounder in the Sherman Firefly. Um, there's this little thing we like to call Newton's second law, equal and opposite reactions. So the faster that that shell is leaving your muzzle, the harder your gun is kicking back. That means you need bigger recoil braces. That means you need a bigger gun bracket, that, or a gun mantlet. Um, that means you need a bigger breech block. That means you need a bigger turret, which means you need a bigger turret ring, which means you need a bigger hull, which means you need a bigger engine, which means you need bigger suspension, bigger tracks, more wheels. That's the, that, it becomes an engineering problem from that point. Um, all of that was an extremely long-winded way of saying that this column is caliber. Now, when I say caliber, I'm not talking about like 50 caliber or 76.2 millimeter caliber. When it comes to artillery, caliber kind of has two meanings. Caliber is not only the width of the shell that's coming at you, like a 50 cal is literally 51 hundredths of an inch wide. It's a half an inch of metal coming at you. Um, what caliber means when it comes to artillery, it tends to be a ratio expressed by the length of the barrel versus the width of the barrel. So if you have a, I don't know, let me get a quick, quick example here. If you have a, uh, a, a, a 76.2 millimeter tank gun, a three inch tank gun, okay, and that gun is five feet long, or I should say the barrel is five feet long, that's going to be five times four, that's going to be a 20 caliber gun. It's not going to be very powerful. Um, but the longer that gun is, especially in, in relation to the size of the shell it's throwing down at you, the faster that shell is leaving the barrel and the harder it's going to hit enemy tank plate. So this column becomes really important. You can tell by the size of the modifiers in there. So, yeah, the L-43 that the Germans put on their early Mark IV upgrades is going to start off with the basic 10, 
multiplied by 1.3, everything else here is pretty much the same, and you get a 13. That's what you see in some of the, uh, the Panzer Leader material. The L46 gives you a 1.4, which by the time the formula finishes up its multiplication, gives you a 14. The 75 L48, this is the classic Mark IV that you see in Panzer Leader and in Panzer Blitz. Let me see if I can find an example. In fact, let me uh, use one that is, eh, hold on. So I keep my old ones. Then I'll check on the chat and see if I've bored everybody completely to sleep yet. Again, please remember, you guys asked for this. Not for, uh, not, not to blame anybody, but <laughs> you guys literally did ask for this. Um, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, that's the classic Mark IV H. So that's literally the, 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 the counter out of Panzer Leader. And the only difference is I've added a little bit of uh, decoration in there. That little bit of camouflage back there, that's just me playing around with Photoshop. But those values are right out of published Panzer Leader. Avalon Hill, 1974. I didn't make any of those numbers up. So what I was really trying to do here was to come up with a system whereby, okay, it gives you the numbers that are expressed in Panzer Leader. Now what that does, um, not only does it, you know, allow you to create new units in Panzer Leader, if you want to create new stuff that maybe wasn't in Panzer Leader but was historically in World War II, once you establish these trend lines, once you know, oh, for a howitzer I give it a 0.5, for a 70 caliber gun I give it a 1.6, for a 48 caliber gun I give it a 1.4, for something in the low 40s I give it a 1.3, and so on, you can now extrapolate that and come out with new ve new vehicles and new attack strengths that aren't in Panzer Leader at all, because you've got the basic math deconstructed, or at least you've con you've, you've built a model by which you've deconstructed the math yourself. Um, the only other major difference in here is, yes, the, um, it's the Soviets. So, the Soviets appear technically in Panzer Blitz, which was the Eastern Front game. It was the first game to come out. Uh, it was published in 1970 and 1971. Um, although it was based on uh, serial games that were uh, published in the General Magazine as far back as 1968. Uh, the problem there is, again, uh, I love Jim Dunnigan. He is literally one of the greatest game designers in the history of the business. Uh, if you need proof, when they ran out of awards to give him, they made up a new award. They called it Game Designer of the Millennium, and they awarded it exactly once. They gave it to James Dunnigan. Um, so no one's technically uh, eligible to win that award again until the year 3000. So good luck waiting on that. Um, then, after he retired, they made up a new award and they called it the Jim Dunnigan Game Design Award. And that's now the award that other gamers, other game designers strive to win. So to say that this guy is head and shoulders above guys like, I'm not gonna embarrass anybody, but the, any other game designer you've fucking heard of, sorry for the, for the bleep, but any other game designer you've heard of, if that person has a clue in their head, which they probably don't, but just in case they do, they have a poster of Jim Dunnigan up on their bedroom wall that they stare lovingly at all night and only strive that maybe, just maybe, if the stars align just right, they'll one time have the imagination, the, the clarity of thought, and the actual game design prowess uh, in their entire body that Jim Dunnigan has in his friggin' small toe. Um, he, he's that guy. You're not going to hear about him in most miniature websites. You're not going to hear about him in most discords. Now, also, he's been, to my knowledge, he's been retired for quite a while. Um, again, the guy was at his prime back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So, yeah, he's, he's one of those guys. All that said, I wasn't a huge fan of how he handled the Soviets in Panzer Blitz. Panzer Blitz, he handled the Germans by platoon and the Soviets by company. Because there was a huge, we've all read Paul Carroll, we've all read uh, Melanchthon, we've all read Guderian, we've all read Manstein, we all hate the Soviets. Um, it was the middle of the Cold War, obviously, and the Russians were 
One big faceless red mass that includes the Warsaw Pact. Sorry, Piotr. Um, <laughs> we didn't think very highly of pretty much anybody uh, west, uh, east of Berlin in those days. Um, and the games show it, quite frankly. So there's a huge bias against the Soviets. I do realize that the Soviets tended to organize by companies rather than platoons, especially early in the war. The problem is most of the scenarios in Panzerblitz take place in 1943 and forward after Stalingrad, after the guards came back, after you know the, the Soviets reorganized their forces, after they got rid of the commissars. So a lot of the weaknesses that he likes to put into the Soviet model expressed in his game system or were no longer there and even if they were i don't think he i don't think it was real i think it was overdone so in what i like to call panzer blitz liberation which is kind of my half-ass rework of panzer blitz i just knock all the soviets back down to platoon level and i adjust the values accordingly i do understand that the average german soldier in 1943, 1944, and maybe even into, well, I won't say 1945, but 42, 43, and 44, especially 41, holy crap, um, were markedly superior to his Soviet counterpart on a one-for-one -one basis. That's the reason why anything Soviet in here, you're going to see a 0 0.75 under training. So they basically just hacked, or I just basically hacked everything down by a quarter. Um, this is what Jim Dunnigan did. Jim Dunnigan hacked everybody down by one half and then doubled the size of the unit to say, oh, this isn't the platoon, this is a company now. That's how you wind up with his values for a T-34 versus his values for a Mark IV or a Tiger or a Panther. It's kind of the same. It's just kind of bullshit. Sorry, Jim Dunnigan. It's just kind of silly that it's for 10 Soviet tanks instead of only five German tanks. Um, again, in 1941 scenarios, we do have certain special rules that force the Soviets to stack in companies because they didn't have radios in all the tanks. And, you know, we all know all the horror stories. So I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not going to sit here on stream in front of like actual people and say that Jim Dunnigan was wrong. I'm just saying I choose to play Panzer Leader with all units on the same echelon level. Let's all go to platoons. And, um, Rather than knock the Soviets down by half, I meet them halfway and I knock them down by a quarter. And that's what you wind up with. And again, this is where you get the values that I have for different versions of, um, say, the 76.2 millimeter gun that you see in 1940 era T-34s with the short L-30 gun. That's a T-34A and then later the T-34C, the much more famous one. Boom, that's where you see the L42 version, it has a higher uh, caliber velocity bonus, which yields a higher number for its final attack. Again, same size shell, it's just coming at you a little bit faster. And again, I'm not going to go through all the values here, but that's pretty much you know how it goes. The break comes right down here, where World War II ends, sort of. Um, Rather than have the guns be chronological in order, because who knows, you know, that would be impossible. Some of these guns are used on different vehicles, and different vehicles came out at different times. It's just sequentially bigger. So when you get into these post-war um, 90 millimeters, so say the 90 millimeter that you see on the M41 Walker Bulldog. Okay, that's a very long gun, and it's now starting to have post-war ammunition. The very end of World War II... The British started playing around with something called Sabo ammunition. I'm not entirely sure what. Um, I'm not entirely sure who in the chat or who in the community might know what a Sabo round is. Okay, so super fast. Here's how it goes. This has a gigantic difference in tank ammunition because I know that some people are looking at my M1 Abrams and my challenger twos and my you know stuff like that in you know modern 1991 1985 2020 um you know tank battles and like good god are risking where do you get these numbers sabo ammunition is gigantic so how sabo ammunition works is and i'll go through it very, very i wish i had a diagram um it would be easier to explain if i had prepared a picture for it but picture a tank shell that has another smaller tank shell inside of it it's probably the fastest way I can explain it. 
okay? You put this in complete round into the chamber, you close the breech block, you fire off the round, and as soon as your round leaves the chamber, I'm sorry, as soon as it leaves the muzzle of your modern, you know, tank gun, this outside part of the tank shell, the sleeve, or sabo, falls away. Um, and as it falls away, it leaves only this very, very dense metal dart. They started off with steel, high, you know, like high carbon, high quality steel. Then it would later go to tungsten. And then today we use what they call the silver bullet. It's depleted friggin' uranium. They take spent fuel from nuclear reactors. They make tank shells out of it. And they shoot that at you. So if it ever sounds like I'm putting too high a value on some of my modern tank ammunition, just remember I'm shooting spent nuclear fuel at you. Okay. Um, now what's really important is they're just looking for the heaviest metal they can. The heaviest, heaviest, heaviest dart they can make. And this thing has uh, these little fins on the back of it. So the complete a uh, acronym is Armor Piercing Fin Stabilized Dis uh, Discarding Sabo Depleted Uranium. Say that 10 times fast. There's this huge acronym. Even the acronym has like 10 letters to it. Okay. And again, it fires. That outer sleeve falls away. And all you're left with is this like 45 millimeter dart. The problem is it was fired out of a 120 or a 125 millimeter gun. Because again, that sleeve fell away. So this friggin' thing is coming at you at about six times the speed of sound. And it's putting 240,000 pounds of pressure into an area about the size of a quarter uh, when it hits the side of your tank. Again, EK equals one half mass times velocity squared. They are going for the fastest friggin' tank shell possible. The British started playing with this at the very end of World War II, the idea of a Sabo round. Um, and it almost immediately had a huge effect on armor penetration value. It's useless against infantry, absolutely useless. But it does, it does incredible damage versus tanks. So you start seeing these numbers here start to crank up. And holy crap, you know, they really start to go nuts. Full modern day Sabo, I give a 1.62. Um, I do give that to some of the Soviets. The Soviet, most of the uh, the export stuff, um, their category two and three divisions, I still give their 0.75 World War II crap bonus to. Their hot shit divisions or brigades, I give like a 0 0.9. There are still a lot of conscripts in there, but pretty much if you're no longer using conscript army, I give you a one in that uh, training column. And then of course optics just start to go up. This is the uh, the scope, this is the night sight, this is the laser range finder, this is the ballistic fire and control computer. Again, all this stuff starts to jack up and you start coming up with some absurd values. So this is the rifled 120 millimeter gun that is the modern. I think it's the L30A11 or something like that, or L30A5. This is what's on the Challenger 2. And the RH120 is the German name for it. When the Americans build that German designed gun under license here in the United States, I believe that's General Dynamics Land Division. That's where you see the, um, they call the M256, but it's the exact same gun. I think the Japanese also use a version of it. I do see there are some questions in chat. I will get to those in just a second. But, let's see, 1991. That's where you see obscenities like this. Now notice that my formula gives you a 57. I put on a 56. Guys, these charts just get you to the, the close ballpark after this you can take one on you can take one off you can do whatever you want i think i give the soviets a 48 um long story short i hate odd numbers on my counters um <laughs> it's kind of a weird thing to uh, obsess over especially when it comes to attack and defense because you have to do a lot of division so i try to avoid um lo uh, odd numbers so again kind of a silly thing to, to look at there but again that's the basics of how i do the attack factor and uh, this system will give you pretty much anything since the invention of smokeless powder. This will take you from the year 1900. This will take you from before night, before World War One, all the way to the present day.
uh, and to anything that's on the conceivable horizon. Until they come out with literal rail guns or lasers on tanks, this, this basic chart will give you an approximate number. Um, as more different types of tank ammunition, obviously, once you get into the 1970s and 1980s, um, especially nowadays, the tank doesn't matter. The tank gun doesn't matter. What matters is the ammo. I mean, yeah, I start off with a high number, but it gets multiplied and then multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. This shit adds up. So, I mean, I go from 18 to a 39. If this almost, this over doubles. Literally, the modifier matters more than the gun, and that's with a 075 uh, penalty in there. Let's look at an even more extreme example. According to just the size of the gun, 120 millimeter, it starts at a 17. Oh, wait. It gets multiplied by everything. It ends up at a 57. Okay, I express it as a 56, but that's more than double. That's almost triple. In fact, it may be triple. Um, am I terrible at arithmetic here? 17 times 3? Yeah, it's more than triple. The, the ammunition over triples the, the, the impact of the gun. So this is why when this person was first, uh, uh, um, uh, Noman Niesco on Facebook first asked this question, I was like, God, I don't, I don't a hundred percent know if I can answer. I've just spent, um, almost 45 minutes giving you the super summarized dumbed down version. And it still took 45 minutes and I had charts and pictures, uh, to help me going on there. So this is why I wanted to put together this stream, because there was no way in hell I was going to be able to explain this in a document. Um, I've been working on this for the better part of 10 years. Um, I haven't been using this exact chart for 10 years. I've been using my own research and my own records and my own files and play testing and building up and building up and building up. But in order to try to express it in a succinct manner, I have to kind of put it all together on one sheet. Um, and even then, it's only kind of a summary. So that's how we do attack factor. How we do range is kind of similar. Here, training still matters, although not quite as much. Ammunition and ballistics uh, takes the place of ammunition and rate of fire. This is basically how well the gun is made and then uh, the ammunition is made and things like that. Here we see some really penalties for the British and the Americans especially. American tank ammunition in World War II was really terrible. It really uh, let the American tank guns down. This is why you see in a lot of games like Battle Group, we'll have a 76 millimeter gun, the M1A1 that they put in their, uh, in their uh, uh, Easy 8s, and the Firefly easily outperforms them. And you're like, why? Number one, the guns are roughly the same length, so sorry, that's not it. But, okay, the gun was just better manufactured. It was all one piece of barrel instead of two pieces of barrel like it was in the Easy 8. And American anti-tank ammunition wasn't that hot uh, in World War II. It really wasn't. Um, and, of course, you have optics and electronics uh, once you get into post-war um, post uh, models. Uh, again, Soviet tanks do take a penalty, especially when it comes to early models. I have a book by Stackpole Publishing that talks about the T-34C in action, and it is all written by Soviet tank crews in World War II, and they're like, our stuff was so bad. Um, one guy holds up like a Heineken beer bottle, an empty bottle of Heineken beer. It is this weird kind of green curved glass, and that's what the glass was in their vision ports and their periscopes. It was just so bad that not only was it discolored, it was this weird yellowish green, but it was like, it was also warped. So it's like, here's a rifle, here's a Heineken bottle, try to shoot and hit a target while staring through this Heineken bottle. I mean, it was awful. So a lot of Soviet stuff has a penalty, at least in the early war. Um, later on, once we start getting into more advanced post-war telescopic sites, um, you start seeing some, some bonuses here. Um, we do see a 0.9 here, but again, this is for a World War II tank. That's for the Stalin II. So again, it's the, the guns are organized from smallest to largest, not necessarily in chronological order. So you see things like this. This is the 120. Actually, that should say 128. That's a typo there. That's the 128 millimeter L56 gun that you see in the... Uh, 
Dog Tiger 6. So technically that should be at the bottom of the chart because 128 is greater than 125, but I'll fix that later. All right, so I won't go through all this again because you guys get the idea. You start off with a base number that is based on just the size of the actual gun, and then you apply a series of modifiers to it. And your modifiers are well thought out, they're evenly applied, and what you wind up with is the value that's supposed to be on the gun. To kind of check your math, you make sure that your formulas are producing something exactly on or within at least one digit of every piece of World War II equipment presented in Panzerblitz or Panzerleiter. Or also Arab is really worse. And once you get past that, now you know that your math is sound, and then you can just continue it towards bigger guns and bigger bonuses for Cold War stuff, and you wind up with some absurd numbers. Um, it's also relatively easy to check uh, real world um, to make sure that you wind up with correct uh, values. A good example of this is here. Okay, we have the 120 millimeters, the rifle and the smooth war that we see on British and German American tanks. Uh, those are the two versions we have there for the 120 millimeter. The L11A5 is the somewhat older 120 millimeter rifle that was in the Chieftain. So that's why we have three NATO 120s there. Okay. Um, but anyway, what we're looking for here and what we're comparing that against is real world results. I normally play with 200 meter hexes, so an extreme range shot at 20 hexes would be 20 times 200, 4,000 meters. That's about what we see in engagements like the Gulf War. Um, is a rough approximation of what the maximum range is, especially at platoon level. Again, Panzer Leader is not a game where one tank is shooting at one tank. It's uh, a little more complicated than that. It's a tank platoon shooting at another tank platoon um, for X minutes over Y time over R range, um, you know, and what you're going to wind up with, or I should say X firepower times Y armor times T time over R range over, you know, all kinds of different penalties and bonuses and what, 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 in six minutes, what are the statistical probabilities that that target platoon is going to be combat ineffective? That's a very different question than I see you, I rolled a hit, kaboom, you're dead. Okay, this is not a, a skirmish game. This is an actual war game where units are shooting at other units. Um... A gigantic, probably even more, well, maybe, okay, outside of optics, the two big ca uh, the two big columns on this chart are here. Again, caliber and um, optics and electronics. How far your gunner can see and hard, how sh far your shell will fly before it runs out of kinetic energy and becomes uh, ballistically unstable in flight. This is very, very simply, um, again, the speed of the shell speed kills and that's going to be all about um the caliber of the weapon again caliber expressed as a ratio between barrel length and barrel bore uh becomes yeah you see some absurd values in here especially good grief the l71 on the uh and the l70 on the panther and the tiger 2 yeah not the tiger 1 the tiger 1 has the stumpy little l56 the tiger 2 has the l71 so here's a quick test for you. Here's a quick thing for the audience, everybody. Um, here's a quick test. And most of you, if you're smart enough to be watching this stream, you are already well ahead of the pack. That's just me pandering a little bit. But in all seriousness, most of you probably already know this. But really quickly, here's a test that you can look at whenever you're going to buy a new World War II game miniatures, counters, unit, individual skirmish, WYSIWYG, computer game, it doesn't matter. If you're going to buy a World War II game that has tanks in it, do this little test, okay? Look up three tank values. The Panther, doesn't matter what version, the, but not the Yacht Panther, the actual Panther tank. The Panther, Tiger 1, Tiger 2, okay? The Panther has a 75 millimeter gun. Right, so PZ, KP, FW, 5. I have no idea what my computer's doing right now. That was absolutely unrequired. KP, FW, 5, Panther. I still don't know what's going on here. Why am I going on to Microsoft Edge? 
I wasn't looking up your stupid thing, dude. God, I hate I hate Windows 10. P Z K P F W six Tiger one. Sometimes that's called the Tiger E. Yeah, that's totally what I asked for. Thanks. P Z K P F W. Oops. K P F W. After this, I promise I'll get into our comments. Tiger two. Um, the Germans did not call it the King Tiger. Stop saying that, games. They called it the Bengal Tiger, or they called it the Tiger II. The King Tiger was an allied name. But anyway, doesn't matter. Okay, so this gun has a 75 mm or this tank has a 75 millimeter gun. This one has an 88 millimeter gun. This one has an 88 millimeter gun. So let's talk about anti-tank values. When this t these three tanks shoot at allied, say, Shermans or T-34s or Churchills, it doesn't matter. If they're shooting at allied armor, what should their values be? Well, the 75mm on the Panther II is an L-70 with a muzzle velocity well in excess of 3,000 meters per second. Okay, Panzer Leader gives that a 16 for a five-tank platoon. The Tiger I, though, my god, that thing has an 88mm gun in it. That thing's got to be awesome. Uh, it's got to be way above a 16. I mean, 75 and 16, that's a difference of what? Uh, again, I told you it was going to be a lot of math in this stream. 88 divided by 75. Come on! 88 divided by 75. That's a 17% difference. So, 16 times 1.17, that should be at least a 19, right? Because, I mean, come on. It should be like a 19 and change. Nope. It has a 15. How? Why? Why does an 88 millimeter hit less hard than a 75 millimeter? L56. It is a shorter barrel. Also a two-piece barrel. Also it bleeds some energy out of that muzzle brake to manage the recoil. The, also, the less it shoots, uh, the less kickback you have on your recoil, the less frontal energy you're projecting forward, etc., etc., etc. The King Tiger II. Now you got me saying it. The Tiger II, or what the Allies would call the King Tiger, goes back up to an L71. It's technically even longer than the Allies, than the uh, than the Panthers gun, which is only an L70. It goes up to a 20, which again is roughly what we uh, uh, expected earlier when we multiplied um, 16 times the difference between 75 and 18. I threw out the fraction. That's how we wound up with 19 instead of 20. But the math works. The math comes out. So when you're going to buy a war game, look up those three tanks. The Panther versus the Tiger One, with its almighty 88 that everyone's so piss pantsy afraid of. The 88 millimeter is a joke compared to the Panther 75. Now, once the 88 is constructed and engineered and successfully mounted and the same caliber length as the 75, holy hell is the shoe on the other foot. Now you see the 88 really come into its fearsome qualities, and that's when you see the 20 on there. So again, it's I don't want to get dirty or gross about it, but um, you know that's what she said. <laughs> Sometimes it's all about the length, not just about the size. So before I get into defense determination and uh, movement determination, let's go through, holy crap, we got a lot of stuff going on here in the chat. Hello, everybody. So Ben Johnson says, hello, Panzer Leader had a four tank Mark IV platoon that read 11A8. Yes, okay, so, and then a seven for defense. Okay, so what happens there is um, Panzer Leader started to experiment with something I really don't like. Really, really don't like. I know what they were doing it. I know what they were doing, and they're they're being historically accurate. I mean, I'm not I'm not saying they're not, but they start playing around with the idea of different size platoons. So in Panzer Blitz and the way I play, it's always very standardized at five tanks. If you want to call it a platoon, I know the Soviets still don't organize by five tank platoons. You just say it's half a company or whatever. It's five tanks. That makes this kind of math very easy. Otherwise. At the end of this math, you have to have another whole series of columns that say, this is how the values you get when it's with three tanks in a, in a platoon. 
like a Soviet platoon was. This is how it gets organized. This is the values it gives you for a four-tank troop, like the British organized. This is what you get for a five-tank platoon, like the Germans organized and the Americans organized. It, it's just another layer of, 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 of uh, aggravation. It also gives you values where Panthers are weaker than Shermans, um, which sounds absurd, but again, maybe it's five Shermans versus three Panthers or something like that. You know, even then I think the Panthers are better, but you guys get the, you guys get the example. Um, yeah, it's not really my jam, but, uh, yeah, to Ben's question or to Ben's comment. Yeah, that's totally what he's talking about there. They had what they would call the Wehrmacht uh, value and the SS value. And according to Panzer leader, which isn't ubiquitously true, but Panzer leader just kind of took a shortcut. They said the Wehrmacht organizes in four tank platoons and the, uh, SS with, you know, more political, uh, priority, uh, when it comes to replacements and reinforcements and new equipment, um, they always had the full five tank Zug, you know, German platoon. Um, Rasm says it seems more stable here than on the other platforms. Oh, oh uh, so Twitch is uh, giving us problems, hopefully. Sorry about that. Uh, D.I. Mythos, or I'm sorry, D.I. Mythos, hopefully I'm saying that right. You are one of the very few that has mentioned uh, about the T-34's issues with optics. And yes, you are right about how bad they are. I had a family in the, their, their defense industry. It was really bad. Um, this is also when they were moving their factories east, and they were basically, you know, trying to build tanks out of um, train cars and shipping, well, not shipping containers, but out of train cars and off the back of trucks. Well, they were literally building the factories around the assembly line. Um, they were already trying to crank out tanks. So, yeah, it gets really bad. Um, there wasn't a, uh, there, there was a, uh, a, um, an improvement, um, later on in the war, um, obviously as their defense industry sort of stabilized a little bit. And of course, post-war, um, they've made a lot of improvements, but at the rate that they've improved, um, NATO has been improving, you know, that much faster. So they've always been about, I think some people overstate it. A lot of games do, like I said, all the way up to it, including you know, one of my personal heroes, um, Jim Dunnigan. Um, I think they overstate the case. The qualitative inferiority of Soviet equipment, Soviet optics, Soviet artillery, Soviet ammunition, and a huge part of this, its it, it was bad enough in World War II and post-World War II into the Cold War. It's gotten really bad post-Gulf War because everyone's looked at those um, those those oceans of Iraqis, T-55s, Type 59s, and uh, which are technically a Chinese knockoff, but Type 55, uh, T-55s, T-62s, and T-72s, and said, holy shit, man, look at how terrible they did. If the Soviets ever came at us in Germany, we would have stomped all over them without even breaking a sweat. Because look at what we did to their, all their equipment in Iraq. We have a live fire test on huge scale. We know what would have happened. No, son, I'm afraid I've got some bad news uh, on a number of levels. Number one, you were up against Iraqis. You weren't up against Soviets. You weren't up against Category 1 Guards Tank Divisions. So, nice try. Um, you weren't up against uh, T-72s. You were up against T-72M1s. You were up against the export value. Strike that! You weren't even up against the export value. You were up against the Asid Ababil. You were up against the Lion of Babylon. The license-built Iraqi knockoff copy of the export knockoff copy of the T-72. Um, you weren't up against silver ammunition, silver bullet ammunition. The Soviets do have Sabo ammunition. They've had it almost as long as everybody else has. You know who they don't sell it to? Um, anybody. So you're up against... Um, so yeah, here's where you see the 125 millimeter, the exact same gun. This is the T... the, the 24A6. The, the, the Soviet nomenclature is very confusing. Um, they all start off with the 18. They're all the same L48 barrel. The training is bad until it gets not quite as bad, and no Sabo ammunition, and worse optics, versus the optics that are in the standard Soviet model, which is even worse than the optics in the NATO model. So again, all these modifiers add up, and that's how you get these wildly disparaging values. You go from a 57 to a, four, well, from a 56, really, to a 48, to a 
38 to a 24 to a 22 to a 20. I mean, it's it's awful. And that's where you see these things, you know, like we saw in the Gulf War. Um, Battle of Medina Ridge, Battle of 73 Easting, uh, especially the later stages of 73 Easting, where um, 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment M2A1s, or M1A2s are just... M1A1s actually are just carving through T-72s like it's going out of style. To assume that a war on the German plane would have turned out the same way, I'm not saying we wouldn't have won, that NATO wouldn't have won, but it wouldn't have been Desert Storm. I can promise you that. Um, oh man, so our, our Twitch is not doing so hot. That's, that's messed up. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, we've got quite a good... Um, wow. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put our YouTube uh, address. Our YouTube. Okay, so um, everybody in Twitch, I just put our YouTube link in the Twitch chat. If you're experiencing problems with Twitch, check us out on YouTube. We are simulcasting on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. Um, and apparently, from everything I'm hearing in the uh, in the chat, we're having a rough time with Twitch and our YouTube chat. I know. Our, I, wow, I'm looking at our numbers. Our uh, audience in uh, YouTube is doing much better. So again, apparently, people are heading over to YouTube. Um, Twitch did fall over about two to three times in as many minutes. Oh man, that's messed up. Hold on, just one second. I hope my battery didn't just die. Alright, my monitor just turned off for some reason. Don't know what's going on there. Alright guys, I may have to uh, start and start start and stop the stream here in just a second here.